So good morning. I'm talking with um, Greg Sadler today. Um, Greg, what website um, would you like me to reference? Can we oh, can if it? people want to find me, you mean? Yeah. Um, well, there's uh, reasonio.com. That's my business website. And then if people want to support the work that I do, they can go to Patreon slash Sadler, S-A-D-L-E-R. Um, but I think a, a lot of people go to, of course, the YouTube channel. Um, just type in Gregory Sadler, and that, that should come up fairly quickly in, in YouTube. And then a lot of people like the Facebook page. Um, I don't know the address of that right offhand, but just type in Facebook Greg, Greg Sadler, and it'll, it'll pop up soon enough. Um, do you want to tell us a little bit about um, your background before we get started? Sure. So I started out as, you know, sort of a typical philosophy professor, well, philosophy and religious studies. Um, and I did that for about 10 years, <clears throat> teaching for, for Ball State University and Fayetteville State University. And then I start, started finding my way into faculty development and administration and assessment of student learning. And around the same time, uh, I got involved with my, my now wife, and she was up in New York when I was down in North Carolina. So I left a tenure-track job where I was up for early promotion and ten, tenure and was moving into administration to go up to uh, New York and started adjuncting for, for Marist. And the idea was I was supposed to be on kind of a sabbatical and just you know write books and articles and, and that sort of stuff. But I'd already started doing a good bit of public speaking by then. Um, and so <clears throat> I started doing more of that, and I continued shooting um, the YouTube videos, which I'd started the last semester down there, and they really took off, and bit by bit it turned into um, a new career. And so now that's what I spend most of my time on. Um, some of it is uh, you know, tutorials, consulting, public speaking, uh, course design, uh, what else, uh, philosophical counseling, and then I got you know brought in to the Modern Stoicism team as the editor of Stoicism Today because I had some editorial experience and I'm, I'm interested in the Stoic revival. Um, but I'm, I'm interested in virtue ethics much more broadly. So I, I draw on the, the Stoics quite a bit, but also on the Aristotelian and Platonic traditions, some Christian thinkers, and then, then the existentialists. And so a lot of what I do now, I still do teach, you know, like I'll teach two, two courses next semester for Marquette University uh, as an adjunct, um, and I still teach for Marist College, but teaching is kind of a sideline. And that's, that's the best way to be as an adjunct, because you don't make any money adjuncting. <laughs> So you you want it to be sort of a thing that you do just uh, to keep your your toe in the, the water, um, but much of what I'm doing now is is taking philosophy and um, either with you know one on one with clients or with organizations, um, making it accessible for for ordinary people. <clears throat> you were just on TV right there in um, Milwaukee, right? Yeah, on, on the local news, uh, they they had a segment called Ask the Expert. And uh, we, we started a new organization. Well, it's, it's, not an, it's a new chapter of an already existing organization, SOFIA, the Society of Philosophers of America. And um, we were having our first event. So um, we, uh, we managed to, to get an interview with, with uh, TMJ4, which is pretty cool because, you know, I grew up watching that as a kid. So, uh, yeah, it was only about a, a minute and a half of actual interviewing. Oh, okay. Seemed like it took a lot longer because, you know, it's it's very interesting. It's one thing to like you know be in front of a little flip cam or you know GoPro like this in your home studio, but it's a whole different thing to be sitting there with the lights and the huge studio cameras and you know have somebody like going like this you know, for the segment. So yeah, were you it was, nervous? It was, yeah, I think I was. Um, not nervous like where your hands shake or, or things like that, but I, I knew that um, I only had a limited amount of time and I had these talking points, you know, I got to hit this, got to hit this, got to hit this. And then one of the hosts um, threw in an extra thing about critical thinking. So I had to, you know, quickly uh, maneuver for that because um, the whole goal was to like, you know, get the event publicized, 
uh, be as enthusiastic about it as possible. Um, and it's kind of a, you have to walk a little bit of a line, right? You're not just a sort of a cheerleader for philosophy. It's not rah, 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 you know, <laughs> Plato or something like that, uh, because that seems kind of silly. So there has to be some seriousness to it, but you also don't want to be so serious that you're tell it, giving people the message, oh, this is going to be very dry and boring. you got to find that happy medium. <laughs> so, yeah, you can, yeah. Have, you can have some coffee, but not too much. Mm. <laughs> yeah. If I have too much, I find myself interrupting people, which is a terrible habit to have, um, you know, on camera. <laughs> Just talking over, screaming. Although, you know, I guess that's a lot of the news nowadays is people screaming. All the talking head stuff. People yeah. screaming over each other. But, yeah, <laughs> I try not to do that. But um, yeah, that's funny. Yeah. So today, we're, today's topic would be um, the best 10 philosophy books for beginners. And you had um, graciously uh, written a guest post for me for um, for my site, which is Common Sense Ethics. And um, so the 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 10 books that you suggested um, are Plato, The Last Days of Socrates, Aristotle, um, Am I, if I mispronounce this, tell me, Nicomachean Ethics. That's good enough. I mean, all of our pronunciations are actually different than the Greek, yeah. so. I have, I'm terrible at pronouncing Greek. Greek. I wouldn't even attempt to pronounce the um, name of your blog. I know what it means, but I just can't say it. Oh, Arexis Dianoetike, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was terrible with modern Greek pronunciation, too. My Greek friends would laugh at what I said when I was there. When I would try to order things, or the only thing I could say was, um, well, was uh, they have this thing called a frappe, which is like it's like um, whipped Nescafe, okay. and so I could order it with, um, you know, with light sugar, because otherwise they'd give you something that was just disgustingly sweet. Yeah. <laughs> so I perfected saying that, so I get my frappe correct, um, correctly ordered, but um. Yeah, there's some phrases wherever you go, you have to have down. <laughs> Exactly, because then you'll get sweet coffee, and you can't have that. But um, but anyway, yeah. So back to the list: um, Epictetus, um, the Discourses, uh, Fragments, and the Handbook. Um, which I guess some of those are published separately, and then but then there's also I guess combined volumes. Yeah, each of these I, I sort of cheated a little bit. I I took you know like the first one, the Last Days of Socrates. So that has four dialogues in it. Um, so technically, it's four books. Yeah. But since it's published in one volume, you know, I'm not doing like just the whole, get the whole collected works of Plato. So I thought that that's appropriate. And with the Epictetus, um, the discourses really are the most important part. Um, we do have some fragments and then the handbook is, is sort of a best hits list from, from the discourses. Yeah. Um, and then let's see, after that you had um, Augustine, the Confessions. Um, yeah. Boethius, The Consolation of Philosophy, um, St. Anselm, Three Philosophical Dialogues, um, which includes On Truth, On Freedom of Choice, and On the Fall of the Devil. Yeah, a little bit of cheating there again on my <laughs> part. And even more in the next one. <laughs> uh, that was Thomas Aquinas' Selected Writings, includes yeah. a wide selection. That's the Ralph McInerney translation um, and, and sort of edition, and it's got stuff from, like Thomas's entire lifetime. So it's about this thick, um, but there really isn't any single one good book to give you for Thomas Aquinas, and so selections, I think, works best. And then you had um, Descartes' uh, Meditations on First Philosophy, Mary Wollstonecraft, Vindication of the Rights of Women, and um, Nietzsche, the genealogy of morals. Yeah. Yeah, and there's other there's other works that could go into a list, I think. Um, but you know, it's 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 difficult to come up with like the perfect list for beginners. Um, it's it's really in many respects tougher to teach or work with beginners because you you don't know what sort of background somebody's coming from. Um, that's why, you know, teaching intro to philosophy classes is way harder than teaching graduate level yeah. seminars. Yeah. The graduate students, they, they already know all sorts of stuff. You're introducing them to new things uh, with the intro classes. Every single one is, is a different um, sort of different setting. Mm. You know, it's not like you can just do a cookie cutter 
uh, presentation each time and it's going to reach the students. You have to make a lot of effort to reach them. So I think there's, there's others that could be added to the list. Um, and I do give some indications in the, the, the blog post about why, for example, I wouldn't include, even though I really love it, Hume's uh, Treatise on Human Nature or, or Bentham's uh, Introduction to the Principles of Morals and Legislation. Or somebody might say, well, how come Kant isn't in there? Yeah. Well, because Kant is almost incomprehensible yeah, yeah. to the average reader until you crack the code, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I, I still haven't read a lot of, of Kant on account of yeah. that. I think that, you know, when it comes to um, lists like this, a lot of people mix up sort of what would be a good <clears throat> um, list for a curriculum in philosophy with what's a good way to introduce people to philosophy. Yeah. And, th and those are really two separate topics. Yeah, sure, because if you're in a course, you'll have help digesting all of the material. Exactly, yeah. That's why I can assign Kant to my my undergraduate students. Um, and then they're, you know, it's also good to have that sort of thing because there's that aha moment where they see just what the, those words on the, on the page that they couldn't figure out mean and things click for them. Yeah. Uh, although you can have that with any of these other ones, you know, when you explain to somebody uh, with Aristotle, you know, this relationship between means and ends that he begins with and, and they finally grasp what's going on with that. Um, or, you know, if, if you're looking at Epictetus and people are getting hung up on what's this faculty of choice business and you explain that to them uh, and then suddenly they understand what proiracis means and how significant it is. Um, so, yeah, do you think that ancient philosophy tends to be easier to read for beginners? It's more accessible because that's always sort of been my understanding. Do you think that's true? I think it depends on which ancient philosopher um, there's some stuff that you would need to have a pretty broad background in order to make sense of. Um, and then there's other, there's other things like, um, I think, you know, the Nick McCain ethics, that's pretty accessible. It, it does take some figuring out what, what exactly this term means and not getting caught up on contemporary senses of things. Like, you know, for when Aristotle talks about happiness, you, you, you have to yeah. dissociate that from, um, you know, a fleeting uh, yeah. pleasure that, that you feel or something like that. Um, but yeah, on, on the whole, ancient philosophy tends to be more accessible than modern philosophy, and that tends to be more accessible than contemporary philosophy, which is often very, um, you know, very not just involving a lot of jargon, but it's, yeah. it's uh, written... For a very select audience, yeah. um, We're dealing I mean, with there a are, specific problem. That yeah, and there are some exceptions, you know, like Hannah Arendt, for example, um, or or Alistair McIntyre. But even that's pretty pretty hard going. So yeah, ancient philosophy. The other thing that I like about ancient philosophy is there's this constant attentiveness to we're not just doing philosophy for its own sake. We're doing philosophy so that we can inform our lives yeah. and you know, figure out what the hell we're here for, what we're doing, how to relate to other people, all those, you know, we call them the big questions. And I think a lot of contemporary philosophy is rather allergic to that. Yeah, oh, that's about right. I think so too. Now, you mentioned before you wrote this post that your first inclination was to tell people, just begin with Plato, but then you spent the majority of the post saying why you don't, why that's not necessarily good advice. So could you elaborate on that? Yeah, I, I use that as sort of a throwaway comment when, you know, I get a lot of people um, asking me, where should I begin in terms of um, YouTube comments? And, and you know, I'm not going to take the time to, like, lay out a whole uh, set of books, although now I can actually just give them uh, this, this, this post. Uh, I'll link to that instead of saying just begin with Plato. But and Plato is a good place to start with. A lot of people get hung up on, well, I've got to start at the very, very beginning. So pre-Socratic philosophers, and, and you can do that. Not, it's not going to kill you or destroy your brain if you start with uh, the fragments of Heraclitus and, and stuff from Parmenides and then you know work your way through. It's just we don't have that much stuff to go on. I mean, if we actually had full works, like if we had Heraclitus's on nature, Maybe that would be the starting point. 
But instead, um, we've got these great platonic dialogues. Um, they don't always solve the problems that they, they set out to talk about, but they certainly are a coherent narrative, and they provide a, a great starting point. And, and I think, too, introducing philosophy in dialogue form rather than you know, just plunking the Nicomachean ethics in somebody's hand is probably, it's probably better uh, for, for somebody who first approaching it, because at least a dialogue, you've got some back and forth, you know, yeah. Epic, Epictetus's discourses are kind of in between because they're his, um, student Arius's, uh, records of what Epictetus said in teaching. So he's talking to an audience. Um, but there's not a lot of there, there's a little bit of dialogue in some of the discourses, but there's not too much on average. So it's it's sort of in between Aristotle's you know straight out treatise, uh, which is Aristotle sort of talking with himself. You know he he he's he's not always um, sticking to the point. You know he he meanders around a bit, and then Plato's you know full out dialogues. Uh, Plato's probably you know easier to make sense of um, than than the others. Now you 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 said that um. You think that uh, that the ancient philosophical emphasis on living a good life, um, you know, how to apply this to your life, is that why Aristotle and the Stoic traditions have, you know, become so much more popular recently? Oh, um, that's a good question. I, I, I'd say that's definitely the case for the Stoics because, you know, we, we don't actually possess that much of their... Mm -hmm their metaphysics or their, their, you know, what they call logic, which is epistemology and logic together. Um, so we're kind of, I mean, it's not as if they're just doing ethics and, and uh, to a certain extent, political philosophy, but that's the bulk of what we have. <clears throat> and so I think people are, are interested in that. And then, you know, becoming popular, you have to have something that people can actually apply within the context of their own lives. Um, where, where it would make some sort of tangible difference, there's got to be some substance there. Um, so, you know, I mean, you could talk about trolley problems all you want, um, which is, you know, definitely legitimate, um, but how often do you encounter a trolley problem in your life <laughs> compared to, you know, the sort of temptations that the, the Stoics talk about? The Aristotelian thing, you know, it's interesting. This is a Total digression here, but I got I got involved with the modern Stoic organization, modern Stoicism organization, uh, which at that time was just called Stoicism today, <clears throat> um, when they invited me in, in part because I wanted to figure out why they had been so successful, and then try to apply that within Aristotelian philosophy, because the Aristotelians, despite the fact that you know the philosophical tradition is so practically focused. Have, have not done anything remotely like the job the Stoics have done in reaching ordinary people. Mm -hmm. Even though, pe you know, like authors like Alistair McIntyre um, really, you know, highlight the importance of taking what he calls the plain person as a, a sort of index and and the need for philosophy to, to reach out, you know, to, to people in their lives. Um, it, it, there's, there's a disconnect between the academics and the people out there who would incorporate it. Aristotelianism, I, I'd say, has a little bit more of an advantage in that um, you see Christians, de depending on what tradition they're from, yeah. sometimes being yeah. formed in it, but sometimes also um, doing it in a very, like I called it, a cookie cutter way, you know? Like you, you just memorize parts of the Nicomachean ethics. And to be an Aristotelian means that you've got to go beyond Aristotle's works and try to make them, you know, fit, fit in today's context. And so I, I don't see a lot of that happening, unfortunately. I see a lot of articles, academic articles being published about that, but yeah. it's sort of like, you know, um, articles you know, about swimming and in, in the journal of swimming the, by people who don't actually do much. They, well, they do a little bit of swimming, you know. They'll go to the pool once in a while, but they're not actually, like, swimming in the ocean. So. You mean they're not on the steps of the stoa speaking to <laughs> students? No, I, most academics are, are terrible with that. Now, there there are some exceptions. I, I know some some really interesting people who are... Uh, what was you know, and a lot of these are within this International Society for McIntyrean Inquiry. Um, I wouldn't say that they're the leadership of it. They're mostly people doing things 
who participate in in these um you know, one a lot of them have to have to uh, do with business ethics, because there, you know, if you have to speak to business people, you'd better make your message comprehensible. You know, you can't just pepper it with all sorts of Greek terminology and <laughs> expect them to fall in line. You got to actually make your case. Um, but yeah, so so I don't think I, I don't think the Aristotelian uh, way is as popular. Unfortunately, I mean, you're doing a lot of stuff with that on your on your blog, um, uh, which is which is good. And I, I, I like a sort of um, eclectic approach where you know you draw on the Aristotelians where they've got something right, yeah. and you know the Stoics where they've got something right, and more contemporary authors. I'll mention two people who do that sort of thing. One is Cicero, who yeah. who I'm a big fan of. And you notice I didn't include a Cicero dialogue yeah. or book in this. Um, and that's just because I think it's it's not as accessible to the ordinary reader, um, but I think Cicero is definitely somebody you want to to encounter. Um, but Plutarch also did that. Yeah. I remember reading, you know, in Plutarch's book on the uh, quelling of anger. I think it's it's the English translation. Um, he'll blend together stuff from the Platonic tradition, which he belongs yeah. to. He's he's a middle Platonist. Yeah. And then he'll take stuff from the Stoics, who he often criticizes, and then he takes stuff from Aristotle, and he'll even like take stuff from Aristotle, like the notion of the mean, and then attribute it to Socrates, <laughs> so he can say that, oh, see, this is this is there in the tradition all along, you know, <laughs> uh, and he, he knows that that's completely false. <laughs> you know, he's doing it, but but what he's doing is he's that doing that kind of blending, you know. He takes what he can use and discards the rest. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Well, that's yeah. that's a good strategy, at least an application, mm -hmm. you know, like for yourself. Yeah, and, and and you see the Stoics themselves and the Aristotelians doing that. You know, Aristotle begins every work by saying, okay, what did everybody else have to say about this topic? Now, you know, where were they right? Where were they wrong? Um, and, and, you know, Seneca does this, you know, he'll even take stuff from the Epicureans, which was, you know, sort of, you know, off limits at that time, you know, everybody hated them. <laughs> but, but Seneca says, um, hey, if they've got something good, let's uh, draw upon it. I mean, you see Paul saying stuff like that in, in his letters, too, you know, take what's good, discard what's bad. Um, and that's, that's what each successful philosophical tradition does. I think when they become very purist, they, uh, they, they turn into something either like a cult, you know, if they are practically oriented, or they just become very boring and, and inapplicable, you know. Yeah. Yeah, but it's, speaking of um, inapplicability, do you think that that sort of lack of a, the or ease of application is sort of a strike against maybe a few things like on this list, at least part of Descartes, like the metafi or um, the epistemology, you know, because I think like it's kind of uncomfortable to read for most people. You know, it's yeah, not, it's not necessarily well, something they're eager to apply. Yeah, I see Descartes as a very practical thinker. Yeah. Um, the reason why he engages in this methodological doubt, um, you know, trying to doubt everything, ultimately getting to the point where he's got this Archimedean point of the. I think, therefore, I am, and then and then building everything else out, is because he felt that um, the uh, the body of knowledge at, at, that he was encountering at his time, and he went to some of the best schools, you know, um, was just not satisfying. People were, you know, parroting uh, formulas, and they 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 weren't really applying to reality. So he thought, you know, unsurprisingly, you got to start over. And it's not the only way that you could do it, I think. But there is something there is something good about at one point in time, at least, trying to do that exercise that he's carrying out of. Let's let's see what we can doubt. You know, maybe everything that my parents and teachers and the culture is telling me is all BS. You know, <laughs> um, so there's that. And then <clears throat> you know, Descartes all, doesn't want to remain in doubt. He wants to figure out how we can get out get out of it, so we can actually do. Yeah science but he's not he's not a scientist who's only interested in you know uh, science for its own sake he he thinks it has um, practical applications so he's got this metaphor of the uh, um, the tree where the, the the roots are metaphysics and then you have physics and then the three M's mechanics which we would call technology uh, medicine 
and morals, and he, and so he he thinks that um, all of this, you know, all of this within his project is going to contribute to um, understanding ourselves, understanding the world in, in a better way. And so, you know, there, there's other aspects to it. I mean, you could say, well, he was a rationalist. Maybe we don't want to be rationalists. Um, what else? Uh, you know, the evil genius, uh, although people love to use that in, in movies, maybe that's not so applicable to us unless we're paranoiacs. Um, you know, there's, there's things we can discard along the way. But I think the, the basic uh, thrust of his philosophy is very practical, even though he is doing high metaphysics. Yeah, yeah. Um. So you mentioned actually um, Mary Wollstone's Mary Wollstonecraft's um, vindication of the rights of women. Um, yeah. And uh, I was thinking that's a bit of an unusual choice, but you had said that you think that she's underappreciated as a writer. Why? Why do you think that is? Well, I mean, part of it is sort of a, a history of sexism. Um, in her own time, you know, she had to really struggle up against the stream. Uh, and she she did break through, and she was taken very seriously. Um, you know, by the time that she writes the Vindication of the Rights of Women, she's already gone toe to toe with Edmund Burke with her her Vindication of the Rights of Men, and she's established herself as as a um, a woman author who's <clears throat> you know able to work across genres. Um, somebody definitely to be reckoned with. Um, but that said, even even back then, she was. You know, seen as unusual, and I, I've noticed. I, I I first began reading her, oh, about I'd say ten years ago, and I was really struck when I read the Vindication about um, how much how much great stuff was there in in sort of a critique of of uh, these self perpetuating dynamics within culture, uh, what we call false consciousness. You know, because she's making the case the, the, essentially it, it's occasioned by the the French Revolution, which is all about you know equality, liberty, fraternity, uh, turning out to be just for the dudes. You know, uh, it's going to be free public education for all men and domestic education for women. And so you know a lot of women at the time. They're hearing that and they're like, "What the hell?" You know, uh, isn't doesn't equality go across the board? And and uh, so she she writes this you know cultural critique that that gives you really good insight into how education is constantly taking place, and um, you know our our intellects, our affects, our habits, all of these things fit into each other. Um, and she's she's doing it from a virtue ethics perspective. Yeah. So she's she's making a contribution to the ongoing development of virtue ethics um, in a fairly Aristotelian way, I would say. And so now when I started reading around in, in histories of, um, you know, moral theory, um, even, you know, Alistair McIntyre, great, great example. He doesn't talk about her at all. Unless, unless he's mentioned her in his latest work, I've never seen any mention. Uh, this guy Schneevind, who has this, like, sort of comprehensive... Uh, the development of autonomy, it's all about, you know, the development of moral theory through the entire uh, modern period. It doesn't talk about her at all. So it's it's weird um, to see that. I, I think there's kind of a vicious cycle, right? It's the same thing that happens in terms of translation. So because people don't talk about an author or reference an author, other people who are younger... Uh, who are in in development? They think, well, they might they must not be that important. So therefore, I'm not going to read them. And then nobody else does any work on that author. With Wollstonecraft, the bulk of the writings on her stuff are not in philosophy. Yeah. They're in like women's studies, right, or gender studies, or history. Uh, yeah. Well, true. Yeah, or or literature as yeah, well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So she really does deserve to be taken seriously as a philosopher. And so I, I use, it's kind of funny, because I'm, not, I'm, not I'm neither a liberal nor a conservative. Um, and within the academy, there's this constant push. We've got to get more women in the canon. And so um, I, I don't think we should just do tokenism. Yeah. I think we should have great thinkers. So if we're going to have a, you know, if we're going to put more women in the canon, that offers me a great opportunity to to sneak Wollstonecraft in, which is what I've done in my intro to philosophy classes and, and ethics classes too. Um, but I, I'm doing it for I'm doing it for Wollstonecraftian reasons. I'm not doing it because I'm endorsing the sort of modern uh, uh, reworking of the academy. 
you know, Wollstonecraft deserves to be read because she's a great philosopher, um, and she wasn't read because she was a woman. Uh, the other thing that happened too is her her husband. She married very late in life, uh, uh, William Godwin. He managed to destroy her reputation. So you know she'd lived a kind of a risque life. You know she had a child out of wedlock and um, with this guy Gilbert Imlay, who was kind of a real scumbag. Uh, he was an American adventurer. He makes us Americans look bad. Um, and then. Uh, she, she tried to commit suicide twice, which was a big no-no at that time, um, by jumping into the Thames, no less. <laughs> so, um, you know, by, by the time that she died, her reputation had been totally, you know, well-established. Um, she had been working on, on, on new material, following up on the vindication of the rights of women. And William Godwin was like, I'm gonna, you know, he's a romantic figure. I'm going to publish this tell-all biography on her that's going to you know tell you everything about this 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 wonderful woman who I love and who's so brilliant and his friends were like boy if you publish this you're going to destroy her reputation because there's stuff in here that people are not going to like and he's like no I'm sure it'll be just fine so he publishes it and sure enough everyone's like well we're not reading her anymore and it, it was about a hundred years before people started you know taking her seriously again and it was largely feminist authors, so so she got you know kind of drawn into to that. And nothing wrong with that, but I think it it it, it you know it left um, it left her out of the philosophical canon. Um, so I mean, there's other there's other great women thinkers that we could we could mention, but I I really I like Wollstonecraft the most, so. yeah. and I think her I think her work is easy to relate to as well because we can read some of the uh, critiques that she has about how culture works, and we can see that stuff happening still today. Yeah. You know, well, what's going on when we like, you know, fall fall in love? You know, can you base a relationship on it? Well, they didn't have Tinder back in her time, but you know, I mean, she could have talked about Tinder, right? Uh, or about you know uh, eHarmony or whatever. Um, the stuff that she's saying is just as applicable now as it was then. Yeah, well, I think it's a, it's actually a good choice because it probably would be interesting for beginning readers. Yeah. No, at least, I don't know, that's my impression. Um, yeah, but in your experience, which, which of these philosophers do you think um, tend to be the most interested in, you know, by, uh, by beginners or by, by just people at large? Like I, I, I said, if I was going to guess, I'd probably say Epictetus or Nietzsche. Um, it's hard to tell. It, it, I think it really depends on the temperament of the person and what questions they're most preoccupied with. You know, if somebody really is um, worried about questions of certainty, maybe they, they gravitate most towards Descartes. That's true. Um, if they're interested in how does, how does the will work, maybe they focus on Nietzsche or they focus on Anselm or they focus on Epictetus, you know, so it, it, that's going to depend quite a bit on the person. So let's see, now you mentioned in the post that you've written for me that um, a lot of people, well, I would say that, you know, some people come to philosophy because of Ayn Rand, like she's kind of a popular, like a pop philosophy, you know, a lot of people read that, yeah. but that's how they get introduced to philosophy. Um, but then you have a lot of people arguing that she's not really a philosopher, you know, and I don't personally, you know, agree with everything that she's written, but I don't, I don't think that I try to argue that. Is that because she mostly wrote literature or because, um, people don't <clears throat> like, like objectivism? Um, I mean, cause it is a philosophical I think it's more, system. Yeah. I think it's more the, the second. I mean, Iris Murdoch wrote a lot more literature than she did philosophy, but we, we consider her to be a, yeah. a philosopher. Um, so it, it's really that, that you know, in, in academia, Rand is uh, really off limits. Um, as a matter of fact, if you want to derail your career, a great way is to, like, go around talking to people about Ayn Rand. Uh, and, and I've known, you know, it's interesting because I, I've known quite a few academic philosophers who are interested in her work, and they're mostly um, on the fringe. Um, now, a lot of them do work on other people, like, like say, Aristotle. That's kind of a common overlap, um, or you know, in in, in other areas, <clears throat> and they may be libertarians of other stripes too. Um, 
Um, but for, for most academics, if you mention Ayn Rand, they haven't read her, um, but they just know that she's terrible. You know, she's, she's responsible for the whole uh, Republican agenda and, <clears throat> you know, all, all, she, she'd eat babies if she could or whatever, whatever it is, right? And they also have been told that she's a terrible um, thinker, you know, totally, you know, uh, fourth rate. Um, and, I, and I'm not saying she's a great philosopher. She is a philosopher. Yeah, she's just yeah, yeah. She's not a great one, you know. But then again, um, I, I don't consider Bertrand Russell a great philosopher, you know. I think uh, his, his work suffers from a lot of the same <clears throat> defects in terms of, like, the history of philosophy as hers does. An ideological position, misreading uh, everybody, trying to shoehorn them into things. Now, Russell made some interesting contributions in terms of, like, you know, his paradoxes and set theory and his uh, philosophy of logical atomism is quite interesting, though totally off base. Um, just like Rand's objectivism is interesting, though totally off base, you know. Um, and and one of them we look at as a, a great figure in philosophy, and people go out and buy his history of philosophy, and and uh, then have to like unlearn the stuff that they they get wrong from it. And people do the same thing with Rand. Uh, you know, if you I'll say this too: don't rely on Rand at all uh, if you're going to read her for um, an objective take on the value of philosophical yeah. figures because she says a lot of, quite frankly, just totally off-base things about Plato or Kant or um, you know, uh, other figures who she associates with collectivism or, or uh, you know, idealism or, or things like that. Um, and, and when she lauds Aristotle, she's often doing so for the wrong reasons. But that's okay, you know. That doesn't mean she's not a philosopher, yeah. you know. And, and if people get into philosophy first through reading Rand and then being like, well, maybe I should read this Aristotle guy that she keeps talking about, um, that's fine. It's like a gateway drug, you know. Only, you know, it's not, with gateway drugs it's bad, right, because we don't yeah. want people doing the hard stuff. <laughs> But it's it's uh, you know it's good. Eventually, they maybe leave the Rand behind. Yeah, you know? yeah. Well, I can imagine it would be really difficult to write a history of philosophy. I mean, because you're you're talking about something that's just so broad and yeah. I mean, yeah. I don't know how anybody could get all of that right. Well, I, I don't think you have to get it completely right. There's it's more like there's certain um, certain mistakes that you want to avoid that will will make it into less useful. If you think about what's the job of a history of philosophy, right? It's not just that the person gets to sit down and, and you know, blather on about, you know, what they think the importance is. It's supposed to be for a reader. Yeah. And, and, and the point for a reader is to help them understand, you know, how the people that they might want to go and read, like, say, Leibniz or, or you know, Descartes or whoever, how did they emerge and you know, what, where did their ideas come from? They didn't come from just, you know, full blown out of their head, like, like Athena out of, out of Zeus. Even that, you know, Zeus had to swallow Athena's mom, uh, right? So there had to be some sort of seed. Um, so, you know, we want to see how these ideas connect with each other over time and how they reappropriate it, what, what new contributions they're making. And so if, you, if you're going to be a historian of philosophy, you can't really have much of an agenda, because if you do, then then you you start you know setting up schemas and shoehorning people in. Um, you really have to appreciate the philosophers for their own sake. So the the you know the historians of philosophy that I really respect are people that almost nobody's heard of, um, but there are these these people who didn't make a big thing of themselves and their own take on it. They wanted to just I'm just I just want to get the Leibniz right. Uh, and his relation to these guys before him and, and after him and the, the, the conditions of his times and, and why he was so fascinated with this idea and how his thought grew. Um, so, yeah, so, uh, so a lot of histories of philosophy, um, you know, the, the better histories of philosophy, the author, him or herself, recedes in the background. And you're not getting, you know, like the Whig theory of history or... You know the the struggle of of idealism and and uh, uh, materialism, or uh, God forbid, you know, sort of the Hegelian three step where everything is thesis, antithesis, <laughs> synthesis, which isn't straight out Hegel anyway. But mm. there's all sorts of Hegelian histories of philosophy, uh, and 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 you also don't want the sort of popularized ones like um, William Durant's uh, the story of philosophy. It's it's not bad. Yeah. 
I mean, if it gets you into reading the people that he talks about, that's great. But you don't want to rely upon it as a guide, you know? Yeah. No, I read that, but I, I think I read Spinoza because of that. Mm. I read Schopenhauer because mm. of Durant, you know? Because Durant, you know, he's, he's great at sort of depicting things. And I was like, well, this sounds really cool. Yeah. <laughs> you know, check it out. <laughs> Now, um, this is, it's a bit of a subjective question, but which of the things on your list do you think is the easiest to read? And then, you know, which one would probably be the most challenging or among the most challenging? Yeah. Um, the, the easiest to read. I would say, um, if you, if you, I don't know, if you, if you got the right sort of temperament for it, maybe... Augustine's Confessions, because mm -hmm. yeah. um, he saves the really tough stuff until the, the final three chapters. The, the you know meditations about time and eternity and and uh, memory and creation and all that that sort of business, um, and it's a narrative, you know. Um, but Wollstonecraft is pretty easy to read too. Um, and then, did you ask which would be the toughest? Yeah. Um, Probably the Aquinas, I would say, mm. because it, it's usually framed in that that you know that 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 way that had become uh, common in in scholastic philosophy, the question answer thing. Uh, so you got to get used to you know him giving you like, okay, so what's the question? Here's the arguments for all of which are usually bad arguments. Here's the arguments against you know, and then only then does Thomas say. I respond that, or my, my answer is, and then he gives you his view, and then he replies to the objections, um, where he'll say, okay, this is right in this sense, but wrong in this sense. I think that, that takes a lot for readers to get used to. I, I, the Nietzsche is probably tougher for some readers, too, because um, this is Nietzsche's most systematic work, I would say, that and the, the birth of tragedy. The birth of tragedy is much tougher than the genealogy because it presumes you know a lot about um, uh, you know, ancient Greek uh, poetry. Um, but the genealogy, e even as systematic as it is, is, is kind of tough. Nietzsche's got a lot of ideas crammed in there, and um, even at his most systematic, he's not very systematic. <laughs> so... You know, yeah, no, kind of all over the map, so to speak. I just asked that because, you know, depending where you are in your life, like, I'm often sleep deprived or like, mm -hmm. I have small children. So it's, I probably opt for the easier ones. Sort of. Yeah. <laughs> My eyes will glaze over if I try to read something that's really, really difficult sometimes. You know, I mean, the other thing is with Epictetus, um, the chapters are usually fairly short, and they're usually on one particular thing yeah. in the discourses. And then, of course, the Enchiridion and the chapters are very short, yeah. so that can be that can be useful. Um, I mean, I think the Anselm is pretty easy to read, because he's a fairly clear author, and those are dialogues too. <clears throat> but they're dealing with tricky topics, and you've got to pay very close attention at certain points, especially on on the fall of the devil. Uh, which is a fascinating book. You know, he's, he's got this this student, a very smart, you know, monk, who's like, uh, you know, I know the standard line on this, but it doesn't really make sense for me. This is responding to a real felt criticism within uh, Christian thought, you know, where people would be like, yeah, I know what I'm supposed to believe, but this ain't, this ain't doing it. Um, tell me how the, how the hell this is supposed to happen, right? God's totally good, and yet he creates a creature that can fall, you know, I get how it can happen with human beings because, you know, the devil tempts them. But what about the devil himself, you know? And they probe into the question further and further and further. And as they do that, they clarify the nature of the will and how we can be drawn in, in different directions. And there's this whole theory in there <clears throat> that, you know, you see also in Augustine, uh, but you, I would say more fully developed in, in Anselm about evil ultimately being a privation of, of the good and that's you know that's an easy thing to say but it's hard to wrap your head around how the hell does that work in in real cases like if i break this cup you know and i do so you know just to be malicious what's the 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 positive and what's the negative in that you know how does that work uh mm -hmm. anselm is giving you the the intellectual apparatus to think those things out but he's doing so 
within the midst of that that dialogue. So it seems really easy to read, but to get the full the full fruit of it, that's tougher, right? You can skim right over it and miss those parts. Yeah, that sounds good, actually. Maybe I'll read that. Actually, which my next question was going to be, um, you know, I've only read four of the things on, at least of these particular works. I've read other works by some of these authors. But, um, so let's see, yeah. I've read Epictetus, obviously, Augustine, Boethius, and Descartes. So okay. if you were going to make a suggestion for me based on which one of these things would contribute more to my general knowledge of philosophy or based on what you know of my likes and dislikes, what would you choose? Oh, um, I would say to read the, the Aristotle and Nicomachean Ethics yeah, next. Well. Okay. You know? <laughs> That's on uh, my list. Because <laughs> there, there's so much stuff there. And now, you know, Aristotle's early on, so you're not – you will get some, you know, discussion of well, Plato thought this, and and you know, hedonists think this, and um, you know, this guy th thought thought this. You're not getting a lot of like stuff later, you know, uh, that'll be saying, you know, uh, so and so after me thought this because obviously that can't happen. But so many people reference Aristotle that I think it, when you read the Nicomachean Ethics, there's probably other things that you've read where things will click and you're like, ah, that's exactly what they were talking about there, you know? Yeah, I mean, I've read the politics. Yeah, well, it, did you did you enjoy the politics? Yeah, I read it really early on in college and I just wasn't really that interested in in Aristotle till I got older. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I found Aristotle very boring as an undergraduate myself. Um, I, you know, I had to read the the categories and the Nicomachean Ethics and On the Soul. And I, I read it and I was like, you know, the categories, by the time I got to chapter two, I was like, what the hell is he talking about here? You know, uh, in a subject, uh, predicated of a subject, what the, what, what the hell is this stuff? You know? um, and then so much of it just seemed kind of common sense. I was like, why, why does anyone care about this? Um, and, and it wasn't until... Why does anyone care? Yeah, I mean, it, it wasn't until graduate school that I started really, you know, I, I, there must have been something with me. I wasn't receptive to it, and and it started to make more sense. And then it was like, wow, this is pretty amazing stuff. And then I started reading it in the Greek. And what was cool about that is um, you notice things not just within that particular text, but with, with Aristotle, he's often approaching the same topics in multiple works. So, like... Um, the politics, uh, the two ethics, the rhetoric, and um, the topics, and on the soul, there might there might be a issue that runs through all of them, and you don't actually know that because the translators may translate the same term one way in the politics and then another way in the ethics. So yeah. until you you see the connections, you 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 don't see that he's actually approaching the same uh, topic through multiple perspectives, you know, you, you look at things differently as a political scientist than as somebody who is concerned with how the soul works, you know, um, they, they, they do have to know something about each other's work, but, um, it's like having, you know, multiple vantage points on, I don't know, a movement of troops or, or, uh, the ocean or something like that. And so that, that really helped me out to, to start appreciating him. And that's, I think, what drew me in to start starting to do work on, on Aristotle, you know? Yeah, I wish that I could read Greek. I'm just thinking about my inadequacies in languages other than English. Well, I mean, the good thing is is now we have reliable translations. And, you know, for, for those of, of your, your viewers or listeners who are worried about that sort of thing, um, oftentimes you can take multiple translations and compare them. If, if you see a passage and you're like, oh, I'm not sure what, what he's talking about here, look at, you know, uh, what different translators have made of it. And it, it's sort of like triangulating, you know? Yeah, that's probably a good way to do it. I just wish that I'd focused on this stuff earlier in life. Now it's going to have to be later, mm. if at all. <laughs> well, that, that's, that's another common um, thing that comes up. Um, I, I have that sometimes with, with things that I get into. You know, like I mentioned with Wollstonecraft, you know, I've only been reading her 
relatively speaking, for a short part of my career. And I, I wish I had encountered her earlier. Um, I mean, Nietzsche I've been reading since I was a teenager. <laughs> you know? yeah. um, and, and there's a lot of stuff. That happens continually along the way. Um, and it's an experience that I think so long as you're continually studying, you're, you're going to have over and over again where you're like, oh, man, I wish I had, you know, read this or I wish, you know, when I was reading this younger, I'd been paying attention to what I was reading. And that's OK. You know, well, that, you know, yeah. that's been the experience for me with a lot of these texts. Um, when I was in college, I was really into existentialism. So I read a lot of Sartre. <laughs> A lot of Camus, uh, some Simone de Beauvoir, uh, a lot of Nietzsche, a lot of Kierkegaard, you know, um, some Rilke, and lots of Kafka. And um, I felt that I grew out of it, you know, in yeah, part because, yeah. you know, when you're when you're like in your 20s or in your teens, existentialism is mostly about how everybody's a phony and how are you going to be authentic and and uh you know all, all that sort yeah. of stuff and so so when i'd read sartre i i was probably only getting one tenth of what he was actually saying and being in nothingness because um, i was only interested in the stuff that yeah. you know fit in with what i was doing and uh then when i started reapproaching these texts in my 40s i was like holy crap there's so much here that i missed you know this is fascinating <laughs> stuff um and, uh, you know, it's not the text's fault that I wasn't getting it. It's my fault. <laughs> you know? so. Yeah, I read those when I was in high school and, you, well, some of them. And then, you know, I attempted, I wanted to study them formally, but there was only one professor in my entire department um, who focused on continental philosophy, really. So, you know, yeah. I learned all the rest of this. But, uh, <laughs> so I think I had, like, maybe one or two classes um but yeah, no, that it is something that I think, like, yeah, teenagers are, existentialism definitely appeals to teenagers, because I was interested in that when I was really pretty young, like maybe 14 or, or something. Yeah. Well, it appeals to teenagers who feel alienated, right? <laughs> um, which which isn't all of them. I mean, if you're, if your high school years are going pretty well, then, then maybe you don't need to read Sartre, you know, or Nietzsche. Yeah. Um, of course, you know, that can be a trap, right? You, you, you meet these people 20 years later and they're still, you know, talking about the glory days of, of high school and they haven't really moved on. Now maybe they're going to have a midlife crisis and then now it's time for them to read Sartre. <laughs> now it's time for them to... <laughs> yeah. It's funny. Um, what, what's your favorite or maybe your top three favorites on this list if you had to choose? Well, Boethius, uh, definitely the consolation of philosophy. Although I will, I will admit that I don't get very much out of the poetry. Um, uh, you know, I, I don't know what it is. I have to be in the right frame of mind to actually want to read poetry, with with a few exceptions. Like I, I really enjoy Rilke, um, but the and the poems are important in the in the consolation of philosophy, but I, I tend to skip over them. Um, but the the rest of the thought is really brilliant. And what, what's really cool about the uh, Constellation of Philosophy, so Boethius is a Christian who is um, living at a time when the Roman Empire is just falling apart. Barbarians have taken over Rome. Uh, they're, they're sort of co-opting the culture. And he has this this massive project, which he doesn't see through because, unfortunately, he gets, he gets killed, um, of translating all of Plato and, and Aristotle into Latin because he realizes that the Latin West is gonna gonna need yeah. this. Um, he manages to translate a little bit of, of uh, Plato and, and a little bit more of Aristotle, and and then he's uh, you know you can read about it in the Constellation. He gets he gets uh, jailed and he's he's got a death sentence. Um, it's interesting because the Constellation of Philosophy is Christian philosophy. But there's no mention whatsoever of Christianity in it, and so what you've got is is sort of how Platonism and uh, the the Christian worldview and some Stoicism all come together in this interesting fusion, um, and so I, I I really enjoy that. Um, I'm a big fan of Anselm. You know, I, I I think he's the person I've actually published the most on, so. I really enjoy reading my way through through his works, um, and then if I had to pick a third, I would probably say actually Aristotle. Um, and every time I read through the Nicomachean Ethics, I get more and more out of it. 
Now, we had we'd sort of touched on, you know, how difficult, not necessarily this list, but how difficult philosophy is as a discipline, at yeah. least compared to other disciplines in the humanities. Or um, So do you think that that's... And then we'd also mentioned how there's not a lot of public philosophers or some people tend to think of this as sort of a dead... Dis, I mean, not not everybody, but some people sort of think philosophy is sort of a dead discipline, you know, there's not a lot of applicability. Do you think that the difficulty is the reason, or one of the reasons for that? Um, yeah, it, it, it probably is. Um, but that's, that's less a factor, I would say, in terms of society, it's less a factor of the inherent difficulty of philosophy as opposed to other you know, genres of, of writing and more a matter of, um, terrible outreach, you know, mm. um, you know, I mentioned teaching an intro to philosophy classes is, is one of the toughest things that you can do as a philosophy professor, which means that more work should be going into preparation for your intro class than, you know, for your upper level classes with majors. But that's often not the case. And I run into so many people who, you know, they find out that I, I'm a practical philosopher, right, working in, in actual practice, and they're like, oh, I took a philosophy class, you know, back when I was uh, a graduate, or an, an undergraduate, and it, it might be ethics, it might be intro, it might be human nature, it might be something else, and I'll ask them, well, what was your class like? And it's, it's not, you know, it's not always the case, but there, it's too often the case where they're like, well, I didn't get much out of it. You know, my instructor wasn't very good. He didn't want to explain things. Mm. I didn't understand the texts, um, you know, or they, they talked down to me and made me feel like I was stupid or inferior uh, because I wasn't getting things right away. And, and some of that, it makes sense if you think about who teaches the intro classes um, very often it's, it's uh, underprepared recent graduate students who are doing this, um, because, you know, yeah. it's kind of like slumming. Or they have a fellow or fellowship or something, or they need to, um, you know, they, yeah. because of their PhD work, they have to do it. Yeah. And they're not seeing it as an opportunity. They're seeing it as, uh, like their private playground and, and, you know, it's understandable if you've been spending your time with profs and grad students, and now you have to go among these undergraduates who don't know anything, and you don't really know how to teach yet, um, you might act like kind of a jerk to them. And then there's like the sour, tenured professors who, you know, have to teach this intro class uh, like they do every semester to get it out of the way. You know, I, actually, one of my professors when I was an undergraduate, he would schedule his classes at 8 and 9 in the morning every day, and... Uh, I was in an ethics class with him, and we were talking afterwards, and I, I said, well, you must really be a morning person, because you have eight, eight and nine o'clock classes every day. And he said, no, no, I hate the mornings. And I said, well, why do you schedule your classes then? And he said, so I can get that crap out of the way and get on with my real work. Oh, no. Yeah. yeah. So I think there's, there's, there's a lot of that, and that makes it more difficult for people. And then there was also this this uh, this aura for philosophy that that really did a lot of damage, you know, like from like the the '60s, I would say, through the '80s, in, in, in particular in analytic philosophy. There was this, well, and also in continental philosophy. Yeah. A lot of them are sort of in love with how how clever they are, but there was this this um, you know thing that came largely out of the Wittgensteinian side, where you know philosophy is 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 not really for most people. You don't really want to study this sort of thing. It's, uh, and we've reached the point where we realize almost all the, the previous philosophies all bunk. And, and uh, it's, it's very difficult to make sense of, you know, you're going to be bedeviled by it. You're better off, you know, like playing tennis or, or you know, eating a hamburger or something like that or reading a nice novel. Don't, don't bother with philosophy. And, you know, I think a lot of the, the people who were doing this, they were they were you know setting themselves up as like the people who are smart enough to understand this, while the rest of us dummies, you know, there's there's TV for us, right, or whatever, and they didn't realize that they were they were screwing up the profession, because that sort of thing makes a lot of sense when there's lots of money being thrown at the university, right? Then you can afford to be an elitist and say, oh, we're only going to let a few people yeah, in. Yeah. But when philosophy has to make, uh, as, as it does now, it has to make a case for itself or get cut, 
um, then, you know, a lot of these attitudes, a lot of these, you know, whether you, you, you believe in this philosophy as a way of life or not, this is part of McIntyre's point, every single stance that we take in philosophy has practical effects. If, if, you, if you're just going to do analytic philosophy focused on this little problem in the philosophy of action, that means that you think that that's worth spending all of your time on and you are sort of treating that as what philosophy is. And then, you know, when it comes time to justifying your existence or, or your paycheck to other people, you may have a difficult time doing so. Um, so I think, you know, re a list like this, again, of, of philosophers who have something to say to ordinary people and have something to say about the world, even if it's not the right thing, yeah. um, but they have something to say about how to live life and how to understand ourselves, this is the stuff that can actually be very useful in, in making a case for why philosophy matters. Yeah. But my, my, I guess my intro to philosophy class must have not been that bad because I decided to double major <laughs> on account of that. I had <laughs> intended to major yeah. in, in history, but yeah, I think the professor was an adjunct and not, yeah. not a grad student. You know, I, I uh, benefited from benign neglect when I was an uh, undergraduate. You know, we had a good library, so I just kind of read what I wanted to read, and and they left me do what I was going to do, and and uh, but if I was the kind of student who like needed the professor to in some way motivate me, I wouldn't have been a philosophy major given my professors. <laughs> yeah, well, some are better than others. That's that's for sure. Yeah. Well, and, and there's, I think in the philosophy profession, there's not enough um, attention paid to who teaches well and who doesn't. And they don't get, you know, adequate coaching. You know, we, we stress um, academic freedom, which means, like, I get to do whatever the hell I want in my classroom so long as I don't break the rules and uh, I may have to have a common assignment or something like that. That's a good thing in some respects, but <clears throat> in other respects... Uh, maybe it's not a good thing. You know, maybe we do need to have some standards. Maybe we we should be like saying in an intro to, intro to philosophy class, you should get introduced to Plato. You know, um, or you know, if, if it's an ethics class, maybe you do need to study Aristotle, Mill, and Kant, um, rather than whatever it is the professor wants to to talk about. Yeah, yeah, it could be. Yeah. I can imagine there's a lot of because I I didn't read I read hardly any ancient philosophy in college mm. hardly any, um, and I think that my requirement for that must have been filled by the early medieval course and you know that's why I've read Boethius and all those things. We yeah. also read like um, Al Ghazali and a lot of the Muslim philosophers. Um, yeah. I remember really liking it, but yeah, that's there isn't there definitely doesn't seem to be a common curriculum. No, and that's that makes it difficult to generalize about philosophy too, which I see a lot of people doing. Um, we don't have like a system of education; we have just a incredibly motley patchwork. Um, I mean, I think that you can say the same thing too about some of the other disciplines as well. Yeah. But philosophy, you know, really so. Yeah. Well, that's a lot of the work that you're doing. Hopefully, um, will change. Will change that. Well, that that would be very ambitious to, to hope for that. You and others. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think, you know, that is something that is, uh, you know, good to see, is, is there is this incredible demand out there on the part of ordinary people um, for, uh, not just for philosophy, but for substantive engagement and ideas. So, you know, you know podcasting. Um, you, you have podcasts where people will listen for an hour or, you know, my, like my video lectures, people will watch me in front of a, a board talking about Plato's Republic. Um, and these aren't, these aren't people who are like, oh, you know, um, I need this for my, my uh, college class. There is some of that yeah. uh, where they're like, my instructor won't explain anything, so i got to watch these videos. But there's a lot of people who, you know, they went to college and they would like that, that experience again or they never had the opportunity and they feel like they've missed out. And, and you know, the, the, the academic institutions are not doing much outreach that's, that's uh, reliable or valuable. Um, and our culture industry doesn't give us anything like that either. So it's kind of a, a nice sign 
in a time when academic philosophy, I think, is, is in decline here in the United States, um, in part because education, it's, it, university education itself is moving much more towards just professional degrees and, and kind of a, a commodification uh, of, of education, which is understandable. You know, I'm, not, I'm not, you know, complaining about that the way a lot of my peers are. Um, but it, it's nice to see the, the philosophy being done outside of the academy starting to be taken seriously, you know. Yeah. We're also in a period, too, where a lot of academic presses are struggling to stay afloat. Um, and I see that as a good sign because much of what they produce isn't worth reading, you know. Yeah. I think I read there was some study that showed that, like, 9 out of 10 published papers in the humanities or, like, you know, peer-reviewed articles in the humanities, like, get read maybe or referenced maybe once or twice or something. I mean, it's there's a lot yeah. of money and time that goes into this, and then it's not, you know, it's either not read and or it's not applicable. Yeah, and those are the things that are being used to evaluate whether people should be tenured or not or promoted or not. You know, um, not what their genuine public impact is. So there's there's kind of a uh, skewed values built into a lot of the academic um, academic philosoph philosophical institutions, we could say. Yeah. Well, this has been great, Greg. You've given me a lot to think about, um, and I hope it'll be interesting for other people too. Um, thank yeah. You, thank you so much. You're welcome. Yeah, I'm glad to come on, and, and um, I was very happy to, to contribute the uh, the blog post, and hopefully it'll be useful for readers. And, I mean, the number one thing I want them to get from it is don't be too anxious about, like, getting it right, because you've got a whole lifetime to read stuff, and there isn't any getting it right in the first place. Uh, the main thing is just to, you know, keep reading, keep, keep, keep engaging philosophy. Yeah. No, that's great. But, um, I'm going to start, I'm going to get my Audible subscription and hopefully some of these are available on Audible so that I can yeah. multitask while listening to them. But, yeah. Okay, very good. Well, thanks so much again. Oh, you're very welcome. Thanks for having me on.